say that uh, most, most of my international experience has actually been with NGOs, but it's still been very valuable uh, le learning experience for me to appreciate. And then one of the most ex important international experiences I've had is working with graduate students. Of the 12 graduate students I've mentored, nine of them have been from other countries, and most, most of them from diverse countries, and uh, including uh, currently I ex uh, have people from as ex exotic countries as uh, Baghdad, Iraq, uh, Shanghai, China, and Hot Springs, Arkansas. Now, uh, here's, here's our, our student from Arkansas who's actually a stand-up, the nephew of Leonard Pike, so he had big shoes to fill. He's holding some of his uncle's onion breeding lines. <clears throat> One of the most important things we do in, under the, uh, the auspices of the Vegetable and Fruit Improvement Center is develop new crops with improved nutritional value. And a lot of people have, have, have talked about uh, uh, finding crops that are adapted or suitable to the local populations. And so we feel that something like an onion, a carrot, a tomato, crops that we work on are, are accepted by many populations. And if we can improve the nutritional value, uh, we, can, we can make sure that when they're consuming whatever amount, they can be improving their health and not uh, eating something of mediocre quality. So as a geneticist, we think about technology in the under the uh, umbrella of something new and improved. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Some of the innovations we use to try to uh, develop varieties that are better adapted, better quality, and uh, better suited for sustainable systems. Now, uh, in, in phytochemicals, some of the most important compounds for human health are carotenoids, which are such as vitamin A and lycopene. And then you have uh, vitamin C, which is common mostly in fruits and vegetables and not, and not so common in other things that we consume. So we, we, unlike other animals, can't produce it in our bodies. And then, of course, the sugars, which are necessary for energy, and, and these are very common in fruits and vegetables. And then uh, a new group or a, a group of interest these days is phenolic compounds because of their potential for, for warding off disease, cancer, heart disease, and their antioxidant capacity. And as you probably know, fruits and vegetables are loaded with these compounds. Now, this is an example of some work we've done uh, in collaboration with Dr. Patil and Dr. Yu and Dr. Jafan in uh, exploiting naturally occurring germplasm that is very high in, in specific phytochemicals. And in peppers, we found that much of what we were producing, commercial varieties were low in some of these compounds, but there was material we were able to identify through screening uh, by chemical analysis and integrate some of these genes into our germplasm, and we were able to increase overall antioxidant capacity, particularly in, in the phenolic and vitamin C, uh, in orders of magnitude. Um, now, they're not, uh, we're still working on the perfect looking pepper, but uh, we have peppers that are good to eat. We're now working on something also for uh, various markets, whether it be Latin America or the United States or, or, uh, or Africa, where they like different types of peppers. So we're integrating this this type of improvement into diverse cultivars. The same thing we've done with cucurbits. Now, cucurbits represent the most cultivated, produced of all vegetable crops. If you, if you put the melons and the squash together, the tonnage produced is, is more than any other vegetable. And so you can see how important they are, particularly in the developing world, because they do, uh, being mostly from Africa, have quite a bit of heat and drought tolerance in their genetic makeup and are very familiar to a lot of people in developing countries. They're also very important. Uh, not just uh, at the local level and for sustainable production, but also as an export crop for, for people to be able to, to in, improve their economic well-being by exporting them to other countries. So they're, uh, they're also a potentially very good source of phytochemicals. And we, what we've done is created some new melons with the very high levels of beta carotene <laughs> that have also better adaptation to stress and better fruit quality, better tasting fruit, better looking fruit. Um, and, and in the process, we've also been focused on uh, melons that would have dual applications. So they would be good in a, in a low input system because they have enhanced physiological attributes, and they would also be good for, say, shipping because they have longer shelf life. Now, part of being sustainable is being adapted to tough environments. And fortunately, working in Texas, we're exposed to a very tough environment in the form of not just the climate, but also lots of, of pathogens and diseases. And as I found traveling in Latin America and other parts of the world in North Africa, I saw some of the exact same diseases 
and stresses that we have here in Texas. So I figured, well, what we're facing is something that could be translated to, to these countries. And so uh, we frequently use technology in the form of, of uh, plant pathological procedures and even molecular markers to verify resistance to some of these, these pathogens that we deal with. Now, as I mentioned, uh, sustainable to me really means resilient. And that means a plant that can survive the vagaries of, of whatever the, the, the mother nature throws at it. And this includes uh, uh, all of these pests, but also drought, which we know well in Texas. And being in Texas, you know, our climate extremes mimic the climate extremes that are, are being uh, uh, experienced in many of the developing countries we've been discussing. And unfortunately, traditionally, a lot of vegetables were bred in northern in Western Europe and California, places that have an idyllic climate. So they might not have been selected for these type of uh, extreme environments. And we're fortunate to have uh, collaborations in many parts of Texas uh, and other, uh, in other regions in Latin America where we can make sure that we do select material adapted to these type of extreme conditions. Now, uh, as a case study, I thought I'd mention uh, work in Guatemala that we did, and as I mentioned, this was predominantly with, with uh, private industry, but also uh, the benefit is, uh, is spread to the local uh, small stakeholders and also just because it employs a lot of people. If they're able to sustain their production, they can, they can keep people employed, people can put uh, food on the table. Um, as a result of some of our work, or some of our goals is to compensate for the fact that things like methyl bromide are, are not being allowed anymore. Very, very strong toxins that have been used, fumigants, to eliminate some of these diseases. Now that they're being phased out, these diseases and, and, other, and other problems have become more uh, prevalent. And they're not going to get any better because we're not likely to see anything, you know, supplant methyl bromide that's equally as efficient at sterilizing the soil. And at any rate, uh, that's really not the best approach to sustainable production because sterilizing the soil removes the beneficial bacteria. So at any, this was started uh, actually when I was a PhD student uh, working with uh, Dr. Marvin Miller, who's now retired uh, from the West Coast Center. And he identified the main cause of, 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 of this decline in melons. Um, but we, we decided to look at this and with a new paradigm. Instead of looking at the top of the plant and breeding above ground, we decided to look below the surface and look at the roots. Because basically, without a healthy root system, you can't have a healthy plant, especially in vegetable crops that have to grow on a short cycle very quickly. If they have an insufficient root system, then they're not going to produce a good crop. And so we started to investigate root genetics, which is actually a group of about probably less than a dozen people in the entire country that are willing to take, uh, take the plunge into this. In, in Guatemala, we saw the same thing that we see in South Texas and other warm regions. We saw this gradual decline of the crops in the field. This is before harvest, and oftentimes, right, right before harvest, there's such a collapse that the, the value of the crop is lost after much of the input is put into it. Now, this part of the problem is, is that this particular field was cultivated two crops a year for 30 straight years. And methyl bromide, methyl bromide, methyl bromide. Well, when methyl bromide is taken away, uh, there's, there's a big problem. The soil is sterile and then, and then reinvaded by the pathogens much quicker than, than they can cope with. And so in, in, in some cases, rotation is the only option uh, because there is a lack of genetically adapted material. And so we, we knew what the disease was thanks to Marvin Miller's work. We screened thousands of exotic melon germplasm lines, we identified a few that were resistant. And you can see in the inoculation process there in the middle the difference between on your left are two lines not inoculated, the same two lines inoculated. So we were some of the first to identify, really the first to publish on this, this resistance mechanism in melons. Uh, we were working in collaboration a little bit with the Israelis, but they ran out of funding and decided to do something else. So this is what's at the bottom, what happens in a field in Texas. <laughs> When, uh, when you have total loss of your crop after you know, investing in fertilizer and, and labor and all of these things. So uh, what happens? Uh, Ten years later, we finally end up with a resistant root system and therefore a resistant variety of melon. Uh, this uh, left 
melon represents the cooking melon from India that, that was the source of the resistance. And uh, the other melon represents multiple generations of selection and back crossing to come up with an orange fleshed, highly nutritious and sweet melon that would be desirable to the public. And incidentally, as uh, I might not have mentioned, much of this material is open pollinated type of cultivars. Now there's some issues with IP, but in reality, open pollinated improved cultivars are very beneficial for developing countries because they don't have the infrastructure pr to produce F1 hybrid seeds as efficiently, say, as we do in the United States. Because much, much of vegetable seed production is produced by hand or with very labor and technology intensive mechanisms that are cost prohibitive in, in developing countries. And there's no reason that a good open pollinated variety will not suffice. Uh, they suffice for thousands of years before the last 30 or 40. So exploiting hybrid vigor is great. Hybrid vigor is a true phenomenon, but it, it's not necessarily cost effective unless you can come up with a system to permit it to be done easily and cost effectively. And that's another project we have worked on, and that is uh, isolating some a gene, in this case, for male sterility that allows uh, identification of plants that are sterile to be used as a female, as the seed parent, and allow the bees to do the work and do it outside and let the, this is used in other crops where it's very stable, such as onion. So that's uh, one system that could be used and applied in developing countries, and it already is, in, in, par in parts of India is a good example, and uh, in other parts of Asia, they're using this type of a system to exploit hybrid vigor. And just to wrap up, these are some of the products of our program for enhanced phytochemical value and uh, stress resistance that are being grown, some of them in uh, Mexico, some of them in the United States, and some of them have been trialed also in Central America.